Hello everybody, Ash here. Now what you're about to listen to is an episode originally uploaded to the Ear Read This Patreon page. For the moment, I've paused uploads to and payments from the Patreon as I focus on building the main channel. But if you are a patron, you can still access all the bonus content we have on there for free. And if you'd like to support the channel in the meantime, there's a link in the episode description box below. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the episode. This is the Dracula we all remember from childhood. This is Dracula, the original terrifying story of a maniac. Here's a near identical version that most American moviegoers have never seen. In 1930, at the same time Lugosi's Dracula was being made, Universal Studios also filmed a Spanish version. La sangre de Dracula corre ya por las venas de la señorita Sua. Hello and welcome to this patron exclusive episode of Ear Read This. My name's Ash. Today I'm finally talking about A Liar, a curious entry in the Robert Louis Stevenson canon. I think as far back as before Christmas I've been threatening that this episode was on the horizon and even before then was rumbling about it with Adam. Do you remember me saying ages ago uh, nutty Stevenson vampire story? Yes, I do. And I looked into it and it's wilder than you could ever expect. <laughs> yeah. So have you, have you read it? I've not read it, but I've read around it. And my God, my God, the man, such a wasted talent. He really should have been writing this sort of stuff the whole time. Well, it sounds like, um, it sounds a bit up your street. It's it's reminded me of a kind of Lovecraftian setup. Oh, it's, defi- it's definitely in the to read list, 100%. The story is set in Spain during the Peninsular Wars of 1807 to 1814. Our unnamed narrator is a Scottish soldier, currently out of action and in need of a spell of recovery. In the opening lines, he is told by a doctor that he needs two months of pure air to renew his blood. This was something Stevenson himself was constantly being told, advice that sent him variously sniffing out the pure airs and clement climates of the Napa Valley of California, the Swiss Alps, the Pacific South Seas, and Bournemouth. It was in Bournemouth that he wrote one of his most famous works, Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And whilst revising that novel, he wrote a shorter story that, like Jekyll and Hyde before it, first arrived to him in a dream. The result was what Stevenson called the not-very-defensible story of a liar. By the way, I always thought it was called a lala, but I... Is that how you pronounce it? I discover that you're actually supposed to pronounce it Olaya. Interesting. Unless the internet is an Olaya. Never. Um, themselves, but uh, they never have been before. So it was published in the Court and Society Review, now included in the... Um, afterwards, sorry, conclude, included in the collection Merry Men and um, Other Fables, which has a bunch of uh, Scottish stories. It has oh, the Merry Men, which um, I think we've talked about before, the, the one um, set on the west coast um, oh yeah, yeah yeah and then uh thrawn janet which is written in in kind of scots it's a really uh spooky one that one um i need to read more stevenson horror i really do um i mean start with those because they're honestly they're, they're great thrawn janet is a great will. horror um horror story but then then there's this a liar which is just so uh incongruous regarding stevenson's opinion of a liar as not very defensible Claire Harmon says it is not entirely clear what the author means. Was it the story's treatment of women he was ashamed of, or its sensational vampirism? Perhaps what Stevenson found indefensible was a bit of leeching of his own. Ironically, given the vampiric nature of the storyline, a liar was pretty heavily plagiarised. The critic Edwin M. Eigner, tracing Stevenson's literary bloodsucking, identifies two puncture wounds. Edward Bulwer-Lytton's A Strange Story of 1862 and Nathaniel Hawthorne's Marble Fawn of 1860. Bulwer-Lytton lives on in popular memory on two counts, his coining of the adage, the pen is mightier than the sword, and his habit of beginning stories with the line, it was a dark and stormy night. To this day, there is an annual Bulwer-Lytton fiction contest, which challenges entrants to come up with the opening sentence to the worst of all possible novels. Bit of a harsh literary legacy for the writer credited with inspiring Dracula, with that same strange story that Stevenson took from. In it, Bulwer-Lytton divided his characters to represent three aspects of humanity, the animal, the intellectual, and the spiritual. 
The hero is a doctor, a cultured sophisticate, out of touch with his spiritual side. The heroine is all soul, but naive in the ways of the world. And the villain, Margrave, is in Eigner's phrase, the story's moral monster. Eigner says that the strange story is frequently dry as dust and reads in parts like pages of a scientific or medical journal. But Stevenson's psychological interests certainly overlap with bulwer littons He plainly upholds a frank and fantastic separation of talent and craft in his essay A Chapter on Dreams. However, he was a greater storyteller, and his divisions of characters into cultured and primal types are not as clumsily segregated. Doubt, complication and contrariness colour the characterizations in A Liar, whose emblematic image is that of a sunbathing vampire. It was in Hawthorne's The Marble Fawn, written before The Strange Story, that Stevenson would find a variation on the primal type with a bit more depth. Donatello in that novel is described not as a moral monster, but as a high and beautiful animal. The novel takes its title from Donatello's astonishing resemblance to a Greek sculpture by Praxiteles, and the characters wonder if he could somehow be a descendant of that hoofed original. The Greek god Pan, who we glimpsed way back in our episode on The Wind in the Willows, was also pictured as a fawn, of course, and is evoked in Stevenson's own animalistic character, Philippe. Fanciful lineage features prominently in Stevenson's story too, as do various plot points of both earlier novels. But instead of Australasia or Italy, Olaya is set in Spain. Our narrator is sent to the mountain residentia of a once proud and noble family. He ends up in the uh, classic Gothic story setup. He's sort of taken to a big house. And he meets this sort of family, this sort of dilapidated um, Spanish family. Um, the mother is sunbathing all day and seems a bit simple. The son is uh, strangely sort of childlike and also mm-hmm. simple. Um, and there's also a daughter who he doesn't see at first, but when he does, he finds her uh, incredibly attractive and is sort of struck dumb by her appearance. Mm. The first member of the household the narrator meets is the son, Philippe, who seems anything but vampiric. Earthy, hearty, living by his senses, taken and possessed by the visual object of the moment. The narrator finds him devoid of any culture, embarrassingly affectionate and downright unseemly in his grossness. Showing the narrator to his room, he finds his guest's comfortable bed so irresistible that he can't help rubbing his face in the sheets. In short, Philippe has all the gothic atmosphere of a Labrador. But we learn early on that he and his sister, Alaya, are bastards. So perhaps they have dodged the vampiric gene, and it is the mother who will provide us with the cloaks and hisses. The first glance of her is promising. Her colourful dress shone out like the red bloom of pomegranates. Less promising is her rapturous sunbathing. As she adjusts her basking angle, she makes infinitesimal changes to her posture, savouring and lingering on the bodily pleasure of movement. Not exactly classic vampire behaviour, but is she at least devilishly cunning? Her face was devoid of either good or bad, a moral blank expressing literally naught. A look more blankly stupid I have never met. Strong no on the cunning. But that's not to say there isn't anything sinister about the Signora, as she is referred to. She has an air of the recently fed python, whose only objective is for the next six months to hunker down and digest. In fact, her invincible content in lounging around and her son's puppyish behaviour has led some critics to wonder whether this isn't a werewolf story as opposed to a vampire one. There is certainly something doggish in the imbecile Signora still possessing the quiet nobility of attitude like a watchful greyhound. It's never made explicit either way, though the dramatic high point of the story is straight out of the vampire playbook. After the narrator cuts himself, he goes to the Signora for help. At the sight of his blood, her eyes widen, her pupils shrink to points, and she springs at him, then bites him to the bone. And strangely enough, Claire Harmon finds a biographical precedent for this scene. Stevenson's wife, Fanny, recalled that sometime during the 1870s they had been in a cab together in Paris, when Robert Louis had started laughing uncontrollably. He asked me to bend his fingers back. I didn't like to do it, so he laughed harder and harder and told me that I had better, for if I didn't, he would bend my fingers back and break every bone in them. When Stevenson proceeded to try this, Fanny bit him hard on the hand, drawing blood, at which he immediately came to his senses and begged pardon, but I couldn't use my hands for more than a day afterwards. Well, tell us us more about the the kind of vampire featured in this. Well, speculated. Um, The vampirism is not ever really confirmed. He um, has a cut at one point, and the mother, the matriarch, leaps at him Mm. um, and drinks his blood. The incident with the 
Signora is the closest we come to conventional vampirism. But the tale still reeks of the crypt. The mood and the language of the story are working hammer and tongs at promising and implying vampiric behaviour. When the narrator sees the portrait of a female ancestor of the family, and manfully confesses to be quite taken with it, he goes as far as saying to the reader that he is glad that the Enchantress is safe in the grave. Just in case we didn't pick up on the irony, a few lines later it has occurred to him that she might not be dead after all, but re-arisen in the body of some descendant. Whilst his cutting himself and subsequently being bitten is the only actual bloodshed in the story, the verbal equivalent of red food dye and corn syrup is being lashed around with gusto. The narrator, we remember, is sent to renew his blood amongst the red bloom of pomegranates. And when he does feel renewed, it is enough to want to further plumb the mystery of the family's own bloodline. After he finally sets eyes on a liar, they drink each other in, she following him with thirsting eyes, after which the thought of her runs through his veins, at one with him immediately. There is a heady, dizzying, wild blood sugar levels tang to the whole story, in its theme of mad lust, but also the thick and fast references to flesh. The meat piles up in the language, as it might in a high body count horror film. So while there don't seem to be any actual corpses stashed in the walls, it doesn't feel surprising that a big and foul carrion fly has set up in the house, buzzing heavily around his rotten nest. No one writes about the horror of recurring ailments quite like Stevenson, and although the narrator's wounds are not much mentioned, they are hard to forget about. We meet him as he has just been patched up and packed off to a steamy, sleazy lair of bloodsuckers. Even without the fat flies and sleepy Signora building up the stink of something recently fed, the climate of sweaty passion and tumult seem the ideal conditions for wounds to start reopening. On the other hand, there's a strong hint that the vampiric relationship has been flipped. After all, though the lodger is giving the family a needed bit of income, he is there to regain his health, and from each family member he seems to take something. Most obviously the mad passion he feels for Olaya. And even though he suspects the Signora to be an imbecile, he comes to find himself soothed and amused by her dull animal neighbourhood. Likewise with Philippe, who initially unnerves him in his animalistic lack of sensibility, he comes to feel affection for the young innocent. That doesn't stop him administering a physical punishment to Philippe for torturing a squirrel. It's surely not by accident that the narrator says, Meanwhile I gained rapidly in health almost immediately after this event. A clear example of mortal vampirism, the parasite growing in health from inflicting pain on others. Is it me you love? asks Elia, or the race that made me? At the beginning of the story we hear in brief the decline of Elia's family, sparing the narrator the names and places, as you are ignorant of Spain, even the names of our grandees are hardly known to you. We hear of their swollen vanity, that the narrator should expect them to refuse to acknowledge him, such is their tatterdemalion pride. The narrator is more than a little peeved at this, and resolves to break down their barriers as soon as he can. Though he is described by the doctor as being from England, the soldier reveals his proper heritage in references to Kirks and Kelpies. Had he been English, these would have been churches and grindilos. The Kelpie reference is particularly apt. Commonly pictured as a water horse, the Kelpie in its human form was said to retain its hooves, recalling Pan as well as Satan. But whether Scottish or English, he is a soldier, and not the sort of man who would usually find himself in the company of Spanish grandees. The sort of backstory on vampires is these, you know, dilapidated, ruined families who are all suffering from haemophilia. You know, all of these pallid aristocrats with unhealthy <laughs> obsessions with blood. A and inbred yeah and yeah. the i always forget the the name of the story but it's based on a real occurrence of a, it's a countess in hungary i think who used to bathe in the blood of virgins oh that seems familiar yeah and it was a a, a real thing which is you know all of these things together combined to make you know gothic vampires so ah, sounds okay. like stevenson was on the same crest of the same wave. The situation of our own dilapidated family, whose estate stretches to a few desert leagues of mountain, is enough to cause distress to the local padre. Seeing the portrait in his room of a family ancestor in the times of its pomp seems to awaken in the narrator a fear of downfall. Before meeting a liar, he gruffly acknowledges that to love a woman is to sign and seal one's own sentence of degeneration. Soon enough, he will consider time without a liar a desert of hours. 
He marvels with interested dread at the descent from that painted lady to Philippe, thinking, perhaps an actual link subsisted, perhaps some scruple of the delicate flesh that was once clothed upon with the satin and brocade of the dead lady now winced at the rude contact of Philip's frieze. Guessing at the bastardised state of Philippe's blood seems particularly ironic given that the character is a dirty admixture of Hawthorne's Donatello and Bulwer Lytton's Margrave. Interesting time uh, historically as well um, to pick a sort of ruined Spanish family. Definitely, yeah. After the the glories of the Spanish Empire, these kind of they they almost do seem like aristocrats from the time of um, Cervantes hold yes. out in the King King Philip. Yeah, held out in the countryside. Ever since its decline in the 17th century, Spain had lagged behind its fellow European powers. It had no industrial revolution, its political development was stunted by the governmental power of the Catholic Church, and in the 18th century, Enlightenment ideas were vigorously quashed by the famous Spanish Inquisition. Incidentally, Philippe, hairy-armed embodiment of all unenlightened thought, reacts badly at the mere hint of Inquisition. The developmental gulf between Spain and the rest of Europe was widened and emphasised by the peninsular wars our narrator has been fighting in. For the good cause, the doctor points out, meaning alongside Spain and Portugal against Napoleon's occupying forces. As recently as the late 18th century, the Spanish aristocracy had been dominated by a few hundred families, who along with those of minor noble status, owned the majority of the land worked by the peasants. This simple system was now being upset by a growing urban middle class. The world of peasants and aristocrats was becoming increasingly obsolete. We caught a prelude to this in our episodes on Don Quixote, and as well as the spectacle of rural Spanish decline, it's interesting to note that in Olaya the narrator finds himself in the hands of a padre and a doctor, rather like Quixote being looked after by his friends the barber and the priest. This, along with the Moorish character of the residentia's doorway, recalls the decadent and bankrupt Spain of the previous centuries. Do they start um, um do they start counting things feverishly? <laughs> no, they're just very um You know you know that's based on a real vampire trope. What the counting? Yeah. It's one of the ways to stop a vampire. You um throw you down it. you throw down a handful of rice and the vampire is compelled to count every grain. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell why they cut that out of the movies. Yeah, well, I, I'm pretty sure when they go through, it's one of the really late Christopher Lee ones, they go through literally every trick of stopping vampires. Yeah. They do them all. I think they do the race at one point. But yeah, that's where the count from Sesame Street comes from. Really? Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. Oh, I had no idea about that. Yeah. So running running water, stake through the heart. Uh, silver bullet can also sometimes be vampires. Uh, the sun, uh, crucifixes. Vampires are very easily stopped. It seems. Do you say running water? They can't cross running water, yeah. Ah, oh, I didn't know that one either. Holy water, I knew. Oh yeah, holy water burns them. No, they can't. It's so many different cultures of vampire myths, but Garlic. one of them is one of them is can't cross running water, like in um, Tamashanta. But that's also witches sometimes. Now that you've said all that, the fact that um, anyone dies in a vampire movie <laughs> seems a bit ridiculous. Yeah, they've seen. Vampires are comically easily defeated sometimes, it seems. Yeah. Oh, I'm definitely going to try and find that Christopher Lee. See, there's definitely one where they're fighting him on top of a sort of a sheet of ice on top of a lake. Mm -hmm. And they're smashing through bits of the ice to expose the water. And then he can't cross it. But I always wondered, <laughs> surely the water's just running under the ice anyway. But whatever. Yeah. Th that would be a nightmare if it, if it went all the way down. I've talked one. more about Christopher Lee than I have about the story, I'm sorry. As we've seen, the vampirism of Elias' family is never distinct, and it's possible that they are simply a family of mad, inbred degenerates. The hills have Elias type of thing. It's even hinted that Elias, purer of mind than her brother and mother, has invented a kind of mythology to explain their condition. I speak to you as I dare, but you have seen for yourself how the wheel has gone backward on my doomed race. In his essay which describes the genesis of Elia and Jekyll and Hyde, a chapter on dreams, Stevenson says, There is scarce a family that can count four generations, but lays a claim to some dormant title or some castle and estate. A claim not prosecutable in a court of law, but flattering to the fancy and a great alleviation of idle hours. Elia has no need to claim a title, castle or estate, but what she claims, or to be fair, implies is a grander, somewhat more 
spiritual curse afflicting her family, and not just a lazy slide into mediocrity and endless idle hours. The story of Elia and Philippe's parentage is that of a lowly muleteer, who we are told was taken in by the Signora. Though no trace of him remains, Stevenson plays with the twining of a golden lineage and an earthy peasant. The narrator hopes to voyage to the El Dorado of Elia's soul. The portrait, which not only captured that one ancestor, but stamped the essential quality of a race, has golden brown eyes. A gold coin rests on Elia's brown bosom. In her voice, golden contralto strains are mingled with hoarseness, as the red threads were mingled with the brown among her tresses. I certainly hope hoarseness is a pun, given her father's vocation and the Kelpies and other hoofed creatures knocking about the place. And since we mention a chapter on dreams, I'd like to talk a little more about Stevenson's relationship with Brown. In that essay, he astonishingly relates that his ideas for Elia and Jekyll and Hyde came to him courtesy of his brownies, the little people who provided him with the essential ingredients of both tales. In the case of Elia, they provided everything but the most functionary of elements. On the bits he considered his, Stevenson said, the portrait, the characters of Philippe and the priest, the moral, such as it is, and the last pages, such as, alas, they are. Considering the brownies to be separately responsible for the interesting bits, we have one further, and strangest of all instances, of vampirism. That of self-vampirism. He clearly considers himself the home of the intellect, the educated storyteller, the workhorse. His brownies have talent and a strong sense of the supernatural, but are otherwise, like the mother and son of a liar, creatures of passive sensuality. Children of the world, as natural and as ignorant as the trees. Stevenson is fascinated by this state of nature, and brownies and brown nuss seems to seep into the story as much as blood. He describes in his essay that his dreams were very often commonplace enough, and at times very strange. At times they were almost formless. He would be haunted, for instance, by nothing more definite than a certain hue of brown. Another time he dreamt of some kind of brown demonic dog with the hands of an ape. This recalls the dog-like behaviour but also obedience of Philippe in Olaya. Philippe is seen to be quite literally a force of nature, as quick-tempered as changing weather but also as frightened by its effects, as evidenced by his terror of crashing water and storms. The narrator's obsession with Elia seems frenzied by the idea that something golden can occur in the stupefied degeneration of her family line. In Elia's words, she stands on a little rising ground in this desperate descent. And yet there is something of the animal about her as well. Her voice, we have heard, possesses a hoarseness, but also when she comforts the bleeding narrator, she coos over him with dove-like sounds. Yes, they were beautiful sounds and they were inspired by human tenderness, but was their beauty human? Elia herself must entertain doubts that they are not. She is a character tortured by the sanctity of the soul and its separation from the body. We know her to be pious and to have high standing with her confessor. In the finale that Stevenson lamented as his own work, she casts the narrator out and makes herself a Christ-like sacrifice. How does the um, how, how is it resolved without spoiling too much? Is there, a, is there a resolution or is it a classic gothic end to a story? Um... Yes and no. Like he doesn't, uh, he doesn't end up trapped there. Um, he wants to be with Elia, uh, so he, he'd all he'd kind of be up for being trapped there, I suppose. But she forces him to leave. Okay. She seems to be this kind of unexpected diamond in the rough, um, produced by this inbred, um, simple family um, who are ruined. Um, but she, she's sort of aware of this and trying to end the family line um, oh that's, an, that's an interesting take out. on it yeah there's a, there's, there's a there's a lovecraft character like that one of the the he calls them decadent one of mm. the decadent lines is p- produces a normal person who isn't a fish person and she's one of the people out to defeat her own family i think that's shadow over innsmouth oh okay well yeah similar thing she's she's trying to She's trying to um, seal the family away, at least, and, and just let them die out naturally. I'd, I'd frankly be shocked if um, Lovecraft hadn't read Stevenson. Uh, he definitely had, and he uh, he had uh, strong views about quite a lot of his um, short stories. I was reading yeah. something about his um, opinion of uh, The Body Snatcher, which was a bit too plotty, I think, was... Uh, okay, his opinion in brief um 
my, my, my takeaway is I need to read more creepy Stevenson stuff. I need to stop yeah, thinking about do. him as just, you know, the kidnapped guy. 